Let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for your your peace and your comfort and the rest that we can find in you. I pray right now, Lord, that each and every one of us would be able to hear that still small voice in our minds and in our hearts and our spirit, that we can have the same mind as Christ when we know him as our Savior and when we're filled with his spirit. So I pray, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit, that every word that comes out of my mouth will come directly from you, and that everyone here will know that this is not my message, but it's your message that that is for each and every individual heart here. And so, Lord, help us to take it in, help us to understand it, and help us to apply it to our lives. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And I pray, God, that you'll um, bless your words, that it will reach each and every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were planning a trip. And since the Holy Spirit was the creative side of the Trinity, he suggested a few places that they could go. And he said, why don't we go to New York City? And the Father says, I don't want to go to New York City. They're too liberal there. They'll probably start calling me mother instead of father. I don't want to go there. So the Holy Spirit said, well, then why don't we go to the holy city, Jerusalem? And Jesus said, no way. I don't want to go back to that city. After what they did to me last time I was there, there's no way. I can't even believe that you even brought that up. I don't want to go back there to Jerusalem. And so the Holy Spirit left in a huff. And he comes back and sometime later, and God the Father and Son, they were talking, and they had a pretty good idea. And the Son said, well, the Father and I were talking, and we thought it would be a good idea to maybe go to the Baptist church. The Holy Spirit said, perfect. I've never been there before. (laughs) Hey, let's face it. You don't hear a lot of sermons and talk about the Holy Spirit from the Baptist church. You just just don't hear it a lot, to be honest with you. Unfortunately, but uh, honestly, many of our Pentecostal friends in charismatic churches, sometimes they place entirely... um, too much emphasis on the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Holy Spirit seems to be the only part of the Trinity um, that they pay attention to sometimes. Sometimes. Uh, In their worship, their preaching, and their faith, they sometimes abandon God the Father and Christ the Son in favor of the Spirit uh, to the point where the Christian faith is reduced to a mere matter of what makes you feel good uh, by the Spirit. Without the doctrine and discipline of God the Father and Christ the Son, many of our so-called spirit-filled churches uh, end up to have very sloppy theology, which is self-serving and honestly, um, it's unbiblical to the core. Baptist churches sometimes, though, place entirely too little emphasis on the Holy Spirit. God the Father and the Son are seems like the only parts that they pay attention to. And they nearly leave out the Spirit altogether. Christianity in many Baptist churches just becomes a head trip and a set of intellectual propositions rather than experiencing and knowing the living God. The truth is that you cannot know God the Father and Christ the Son without experiencing the Holy Spirit in your life. Yet many churches have badly neglected the true place of the Holy Spirit. It is the key to living the Christian life. Both types of churches uh, share one thing in common and that they assume that the Holy Spirit is only for certain people. Charismatic churches uh, often try to put rules and restrictions on the Spirit, and you only have the Spirit if, if you speak in tongues or if you, you know, uh, clap your hands and, and uh, wave your arms, you know, in the service. And those are the only people that really possess the Spirit, and, you know, they have that born-again experience. This usually leads to a feeling of 
a spiritual superiority. You know, you feel like, well, I have the spirit of God, and, and you don't, obviously, because you're not speaking in tongues and you're not waving your arms or rolling on the floor. So today I want this to be a teaching time, but I promise you this message of, from God will inspire you and it will show you what you need in your life in order to live a powerful um, Christian life that so many of us lack. So let me clear up a few things about the Holy Spirit. Number one, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not just some force or energy. May the force be with you. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a ghost like friendly the Casper ghost. In fact, the word spirit in the Greek is the word pneuma with a P. P-N-E-U-M-A. Pneuma, and it actually means wind or breath. So it's not like the word ghost in the King James Version is spirit in other versions. It's actually, that word spirit or ghost actually means breath, the holy breath or the holy wind. But it is a person. Uh, pneumatology, pneumatology, pneumatology with a P, P-N-E-U-M-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit comes from two Greek words, pneuma, meaning wind or breath, and logos, which we know means word. And so pneumatology is the study or doctrines of the Holy Spirit, this pneumatology. Now, the Holy Spirit is not just a part of God. He is God. He's the third person of the Trinity. And when we think of God, we think that that God is in three parts. That's not true, folks. God the Father is a part, God the Son is a part, and God the Holy Spirit is a part. And all they, they make up one God. That's not true. They're not part of God. They are God. Each and every individual, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, are all not just a part, but they are God. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. God, not just part of God, but all three are one in the same. You can't logically understand that in our minds. It's like, how, how's that happen? But God can be whoever he wants to be. If he wants to be three people, separate people, but yet one person, he can do that. But that's what the Bible says. That's exactly um, what it is with the Trinity. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. The one and only true God that we're talking about here. I'll prove it to you. All through scripture it tells us that. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. You know the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We learned this in my Sunday school class. And uh, in, in this story, uh, Peter tells Ananias, he says, Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. And he says, you have not lied to man, you have lied to God. See? So the Spirit is always identified with God, the Father, and God the Son. When Jesus commissioned the disciples, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's not left out there. So now, what role does the Holy Spirit have in our lives? That's what we're going to look at today. And how does the Holy Spirit influence us and help us in our lives today? This is an extremely important message that God laid on my heart to share with you. So John chapter 16, let's turn to John chapter 16. John chapter 16. This is the night before Jesus was crucified. And John chapters 14 through 17, actually, is the night before Jesus was crucified. John chapter 16, verses 1 to 15. And here, Jesus tells his disciples that he's going away. And he says, it's to your advantage that I'm going away. It's because I'm going to give my spirit to you. 
He says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. Uh, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think, uh, will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin, because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, that's the devil, is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that you are to come, that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So this is the night before Jesus was crucified, and he's talking to his disciples that he's going away, and he will no longer be with them in person. But then he says, but it's good. It's to your advantage, actually, that I leave this world and go on to heaven to be with the Father. He says in verse 7, it is to your advantage that I go away. Well, what's such a great advantage? Jesus is not going to be here anymore. Are you kidding me? What could be, how could that be an advantage? He said, because if he didn't leave, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come and dwell in your hearts and be with you wherever you go. You see, uh, when Jesus was here on earth as a human being, he wouldn't he would only be one place at a time. And after he died, the Holy Spirit would come in and indwell every single one of them, all believers, and would go with them wherever they go to give them power and knowledge to instruct them and to, to reveal to them the truth and, and, and to guide them every place they go. So in other words, Jesus, God's Spirit, God himself, will be with you wherever you go. See? In verse 7, it says, The Helper will come to you. That word helper in the Greek is the word paraclete. Paraclete. P-A-R-A-C-L-E-T-E. -E. Paraclete. It actually means to come alongside of. I'm going to come alongside of you and help you. And, and it refers to one who consoles, comforts, one who encourages or uplifts, refreshes. Do you need refreshment? You need to be refreshed. If you're down and out and if, if you just, you know, don't feel the energy, you don't feel like doing anything for God, the Holy Spirit can, can refresh us. Um, he, he's one who intercedes on our behalf as an advocate in court. We all need an advocate before God. The greatest advantage a person can have in life is having the Holy Spirit living within them. That's a fact. The greatest advantage you and I have is to have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. Before a person is saved, the Holy Spirit still works. He's still at work. The Bible says here that he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and of judgment. In verse 8 through 12, again, it says, And when he comes, he will convict the world, the world, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Uh, before Christmas, um, uh, I, I've been training a, a young man uh, named Wilson. He's 
um, from Guatemala, and I met his whole family. Of course, I traveled to Guatemala before, and, and um, they're good people. And, and uh, so I've been training this young man for about a year, and um, around Christmas time, he started talking to me. He says he wanted to know about the end times, because all the things happen in, in the world today. And, and so he said, can you tell me about the end times? So I was telling him about the end times, and, and I, I started sharing the gospel to him. I said, if you're not a believer... If you're not a Christian, you're going to be left behind. And he knows that his mother's a Christian. His mother's been a Christian for a long time, goes to church all the time. And, uh, and so I, I said, would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I, I'll say a prayer, and you can repeat after me. And I, and I explained to him the plan of salvation and the gospel message. And I thought clearly, and, and he said, no, not right now. I'm like, What? Did I say something wrong? I, I said, well, you know, you can pray on your own, you know, and, and you don't have to pray after me. You, you can pray on your own. You just go home. I thought maybe he was maybe embarrassed to maybe pray in front of me or, you know, um, but I said, you can pray on your own. He says, no, if, if I pray the prayer, I'll do it with you, but I, 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 I want to think about it first. Well, I didn't say another word about it. Christmas passes, and, and then um, uh, first few weeks in January, and I didn't say a word. Two weeks ago, we're working out. He says, you know, mister, he's very respectful. He calls me sir and mister. And he says, you know, mister, I wanna, I'm ready to accept Jesus into my life. I said, wow, fantastic. That's the best decision that you'll ever make. And so we, we prayed in, in my car. And uh, he's very sincere. And he's, he gave me a big hug and... and um, uh, I bought him a Bible, and, and uh, he's been going through the, the Gospel of John, and he's been reading it. He's on ch chapter 6 right now, and, and we talk about it every time we work out and so forth. But, but um, what, what convinced him to finally accept Jesus Christ as his personal Savior? I mean, what convinced him? Was it my great ability to explain the Bible, you know? And, and uh, of course not. He didn't even accept the Lord when I was talking to him. You see, it was God's Holy Spirit working in his life. I didn't even say another word about it. I didn't want to bug him. I didn't want to, you know, try to force him or, or persuade him. That's not my job. And in fact, if I persuaded him, then it wouldn't be for real. It wouldn't be serious. And he made a change in his life. Uh, I, I just, I mean, it's amazing. He is so excited about reading the Bible. That's what happens, you see, when you come to know Jesus as your personal Savior. Your life has changed. Old things pass away. All things are new. And all of a sudden, you've got this desire within you to learn more and to grow. See, that's the Holy Spirit of God working in you. First, before you're saved, he convicts you. And he says, you need to come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He worked in his life. And so the next day, I said, did you tell your mom? Because I knew she was a Christian. He said, no, I didn't tell my mom yet. I, I, I want to tell my mom. But first, I, I feel like I, I need to apologize to my mom because I was... I was talking back to her. You know, I was, I, I'm a bad kid. He said. I said, he said, um, not a real bad kid, but, you know, I talked back to my parents, and, and um, you know, and my parents were getting a divorce, and they are separated now, and I got real mad, and I started talking back to her. So I just feel like I have to apologize to her before I tell her. And so I didn't say anything. Next day, he says, I told my mom, and I apologized to my mom. And she cried tears of joy. And I want to ask you again, you know, what would give him the idea that he needed to apologize to his mother? Certainly wasn't me, even though I felt like saying, yeah, you need to apologize to your mother because nobody should, should disrespect their mother. The Bible says that's the last thing you should do. Nobody should ever disrespect their parents and, and you should honor your parents. That's one of the Ten Commandments. You need to do that right now. I didn't say anything. He just went and did it. He, who, who convinced him that he needed to do that? That's the Holy Spirit of God living in him. You see, the way God works. Now, what things in life influence you? There are several things. You know, our peers influence us, our family, our friends, our um, loved ones, our, our co-workers, our classmates influence us. Um, also, ourself, our own evil desires that come from within, the Bible says, um, tempt us to sin. And then Satan influences us. And, and listen, our conscience 
God gave us all a conscience, influences us. That's our alarm system. It warns us and tells us what's good and bad. Look out, warning, warning, warning. This is going to be bad. You shouldn't do this. You know, It's our moral compass inside of each and every one of us. You've heard Jiminy Cricket say, you know, let your conscience be your guide, you know, in Pinocchio, you know, let your conscience be your guide, you know. And, um, but I will tell you that the, your conscience can become corrupt. In fact, the Bible says it can become seared like a hot iron sears. You know, 1 Timothy 4, 2. In other words, your conscience can become insensitive, numb, dull, dulling the senses of right from wrong. In other words, people can no longer feel guilty. Their conscience doesn't work in them anymore because Satan has got a hold of your conscience and, and you know, they sin and sin and sin and sin. No, there's nothing. Now, now it's like, ah, it's not a sin. That's not a sin. No, it's not wrong to do that. You know, and we don't feel guilty anymore. And so our conscience, you know, is, is not reliable because it's imperfect. But let me tell you something else that influences us. The main one that influences us is the Holy Spirit as Christians. And the Holy Spirit is perfect. He'll never lead you astray. We can rely on the Holy Spirit. We cannot rely on the conscience. So the Holy Spirit is perfect. And so, um, just like it says in, in, in this chapter, chapter 16, verse 13, it says, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. You want to know what the truth is? He will guide you into all truth. Let the Spirit be your guide, not your conscience. Too many of us are relying on our conscience. And when, when we argue, well, it's not a sin to do that, it's not a sin to do that, and, uh, and we try to justify it. That, that's our conscience that's, that's just getting a little bit more dull. A 12-year-old boy uh, was at a revival meeting in church, and he he heard the gospel message and he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal savior. He went home and told his friends. And one, one of his friends says, well, what, what happened? I mean, did you see a vision of God? And the little boy said, no. The other boy said, well, did you hear God's voice? The little boy said, no. He said, it's kind of like fishing. You know, when you have a fish on the other line and, and you're reeling it in, you know, you, you don't see the fish and you don't hear the fish. You just feel the fish tug on your line. And it's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. He's going to tug on your heart. You ever feel the Holy Spirit tug on your heart? I know you do. In fact, the Holy Spirit's tugging on your heart right now. I hope you, you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you see, because the Holy Spirit wants to change your life and the Holy Spirit wants to be part of your life. But some of us are not allowing the Holy Spirit to even take part in our life, even though he's He's God in spirit. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Too many Christians are not sensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice, that still small voice inside of us. That's the Holy Spirit talking to us, you see. And he's talking to us right now. And if you don't hear him, maybe your ears are clogged. You, you, you might not be able to hear my voice because of hearing problems, but I know that you can hear the voice of God if you're sensitive to God. That's the Holy Spirit. A park ranger from Yellowstone National Park was leading a group of hikers to a fire lookout, and, and the ranger was so intent on telling the hikers about the fires, the animals, and the landscape that he can, you know... Um, that he considered the messages on his two-way radio to be distracting, and so he turned off his radio. Well, as the, as the group neared the tower, the ranger was met by a nearly breathless lookout guy who asked why he hadn't responded to uh, the messages on his radio. He said, because a grizzly bear had been stalking your group for miles, and, and um, we wanted to warn you of the danger. Anytime we tune out the Holy Spirit or ignore the warnings of the Bible, we put ourselves and those around us in danger. God has given each one of us who has accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. God 
living inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? It means that we can be changed, transformed into the image of God, Almighty God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit, listen, regenerates us, sanctifies us, empowers us, anoints us for ministry, washes us, renews us, distributes the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit to us. I went, and, and I can go on and on and on. And I can give you scripture for each and every one of us. But we'd be here for another hour. So, but the, the Holy Spirit is totally involved in our life in every way, even if you don't know it. Now turn over to one other scripture, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> verses 1 to 7, and then verse 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one, listen, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Underline those last two sentences. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of, of service, but the same Lord. There are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Then look at verse 12. For just as the body, is referring to the body of Christ, is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit... We were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. First of all, let's take a look at verse 3 again. Verse 3. I wanted to point this out. No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. In other words, only believers, this is important, only believers can acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Only believers. Only if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior can you acknowledge Jesus is Lord. If you don't have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, you are not a believer, and you cannot acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord in your life. It says, Romans 8, 9, it says, anyone who does not have the Holy Spirit of God in them, he does not belong to God. So if you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, you're not a Christian. Because when you become a Christian, the Holy Spirit makes, takes up residence in your life, and He never leaves you. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, you certainly cannot acknowledge Jesus is Lord. So, a couple of weeks ago I spoke on false gospels. And one of the false gospels was the lordship gospel. You have to make Jesus lord of your life to be saved. And that's false. And so making Jesus lord of your life for salvation, it's not a requirement for salvation. You can't make Jesus lord of your life until you're saved because you don't have the spirit of God living in you. Until you're saved. Do you understand that? No one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Spirit. So the moment you accept Jesus as your Savior, then he can, you can make him Lord of your life as well. And you, become, you can become his disciple. Not before, but as soon as you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Now, the, there's three things about the Holy Spirit are the biggest misunderstandings in the Bible. And it's why we had the different denominations, to be honest with you. 
And, uh, and so I wanted to explain these three things to you and show you from Scripture that um, these three things are important to understand. If you do not understand these three things, the meaning and what they are, exactly what they, they are, then you will be confused with pneumatology, the doctrines of the Holy Spirit. You will not understand and you will, you know, just continue, you know, not really grasping uh, the Holy Spirit and, and experiencing the Holy Spirit in your life. So these three things are important. I'm going to talk about these three things. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Folks, this is right on doctrine. And this is scripture. Okay? And don't confuse one with the other. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Okay? If you're confused about those, then your doctrine is going to be off. And so, first let's take the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ as your, Holy Spirit, as your Savior, then the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up residence in your life. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit will never leave you. Okay? And in fact, Romans 8 and 9 again says, if you do not have the Spirit of God living in you, then you do not belong to Him. Right now, if you do not have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, you're not a Christian. Okay? If you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, the Holy Spirit will never leave you, and he, He's there. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Not only that, but the Holy Spirit will never leave you. Now let me read to you Ephesians 1.13 to prove that. Because there are many churches who really think that you can fall from grace. Think that will tell you that if you do something really bad, then you're not a Christian anymore. The Holy Spirit's going to leave you. Okay? And some, some churches will even tell you, yeah, we believe in eternal security, but we do believe that you can fall from grace. What's the difference? Okay? You cannot fall from grace if, if you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you because the Holy Spirit will never leave you. You're, once you're saved, you're always saved, and that will never change. Okay? Ephesians 1.13 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the greatest verse in the Bible for eternal security, that you can never lose your salvation. The greatest verse, why? Because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee that you will never lose your salvation. It even says until we acquire possession of it, until we reach heaven, the Holy Spirit is going to be there for you. He sealed your, your salvation, and he guarantees it. Now, if you or I guaranteed our own salvation, then we'd be in real trouble. Okay? But when the Holy Spirit guarantees it and seals you, then you can be absolutely sure, 100%, that you're going to heaven no matter what happens after this. You can even say, I don't believe in God anymore, and still be saved if you really truly made a decision earlier on in your life. Because a lot of people fall away. And so, anyone who believes that you can lose your salvation is not placing too much confidence in the Holy Spirit. And you can tell them that. It's absolutely false doctrine. And if you believe that you can lose your salvation, then it's not salvation. Because it becomes works. you got to be good enough to get to heaven. If you're not, you know, fall from grace, then, then you're no longer saved. So you got to be good. No, that's not true. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is a, there's a lot of confusion within the Pentecostal churches and Baptist churches. about, And even a lot of Baptist churches don't understand what baptism of the Holy Spirit is. This is what it is, I'm telling you. It's right here in this scripture. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13, it talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not the same as water baptism. That's after you're saved. You, you entered the waters for baptism um, to demonstrate that you are a Christian. That's water baptism. This is not water baptism. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? It says, look at verse 13. Verse 13, it says it all right here. And so if you stray from this verse and try to make spirit baptism anything else but what this verse says, you're false. It's false doctrine. It's wrong, absolutely wrong, okay? This is what spirit baptism is. It says, for in one spirit... We were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. That's spirit baptism. It describes exactly what spirit baptism is. It's when the Holy as soon as you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, at that very moment, you, the Holy Spirit comes into you, that, that's the indwelling, but also you're baptized <coughs> by the Holy Spirit. In other words, it says here, the Holy Spirit places you into the body of Christ, which is the church, right? We're all members of one body. Just like we have members of our, our own physical bodies, we're all members, Christians are all members of one body. We all have different functions, different gifts, but we're all members of that body, okay? And how do we become a member of the body of Christ? the Holy Spirit places us into the body of Christ. Okay? You won't feel it. You won't roll on the floor. You won't laugh hysterically. You won't do some crazy thing. It happens without you even knowing it. Okay? And you don't have to say, you know, you're, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit now. You know, because... A young Christian is not going to understand this, but it just happens automatically, okay? And so, um, now, the Holy Spirit, once he places us in the body at salvation, at that very moment also, he gives you spiritual gifts. It might be preaching, it might be teaching, it might be encouraging, it might be helping, it might be serving, it might be giving. And, and in, the old, in the New Testament times, it, it even had to do with people were able to speak in tongues. What is that, speaking in tongues? It's if I was um, uh, over there in China and I wanted to share the gospel with somebody, God would give me the power and the knowledge to be able to speak Mandarin. I would automatically, like that, without having any classes, I would be able to speak to that Chinese person so that they can understand the gospel message. You see, and the reason God gave those gifts back then, uh, speaking in tongues, is because the Bible was not completed, okay? And so there were places in the world that didn't hear the gospel, that didn't have that gospel message. And so, so in order to share the gospel in all languages of the world, it's not a he heavenly gibberish. That's not, that's not what speaking in tongues is. But these, so the Holy Spirit is the one who gave these gifts and distributed the gifts to people, okay? And the Holy Spirit is the one who decides whether you have the gift of speaking in tongues or preaching or teaching. You can't say, well, I want the gift of speaking in tongues because that's pretty impressive. You can't, you can't have the gifts that you just want. God, you can't even pray for the gift of tongues because it's all up to God. God knows what he wants you to do. And if you need the gift of tongues, if you're going to go over to some foreign country that never heard the gospel before, where the Bible's not written, he might give you the gift of tongues, but it's not needed here. And so God's going to give you a gift. It might be one or two gifts. Okay? God has given me the gift of teaching. Okay? And administration, leadership. Okay? Those are my two gifts. My, my gift is not preaching. It's teaching. And so, but we all have different gifts to be used in the body of Christ. That's, um, and that comes from the Holy Spirit. And so now it's up to us to develop those gifts and to use those gifts in the church. But baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit places you into the body of Christ when the moment we're saved. 
So the moment we're saved, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and we're baptized by the Holy Spirit, which means we're placed in the body of Christ. And so, now what about the filling of the Spirit? A lot of people misunderstand this. They say, well, when you're filled with the Spirit, He just fills you up with God's Spirit, right? No, that's not it. That's not correct. You already have the Holy Spirit. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You don't have less and less and less and less of the Holy Spirit in you, and then all of a sudden, when you're filled, He fills you up back up again. That's, that, that's not what the Bible teaches. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, And be not drunk with wine in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That word filled in the Greek means controlled. So basically, it could say, you know, in the Greek, it would say, Do not let wine control you. Instead, let the Spirit of God control you. So in Acts chapter 2 and all throughout Acts, the book of Acts, and here in Ephesians, the word filled means controlled. Okay? So it doesn't mean that Holy Spirit's going to just fill you up. That's not what it means. Okay? The Holy Spirit already filled, I mean, already came in and filled you. I mean, and indwelt you. So filled means controlled. Just as wine might control your thoughts and your actions and what you say. I've seen some drunk guys, men. There's one guy, you know, said, I, I'm Superman, you know, and he gets up on a table and jumps off and, and uh, nearly breaks his neck. You know, that, they're influenced, they're under the influence <laughs> of alcohol. Well, you know, if you're influenced by the Holy Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit, you're going to do some things that you normally wouldn't do. I don't think you're going to claim to be Superman. But you're going you're gonna to be able to do some things that you never thought you could do, like maybe teach a Sunday school class. Maybe talk to somebody about Jesus. You're going to be doing some amazing things, okay, when you allow God to control you. Instead of allowing wine to control and influence you, you allow God to fill you and control you, your mind, your actions, and what you say. Every time I come in the pulpit, you will, if you listen to my prayers, you will listen to me pray, and every time I teach a class, I will say, God, fill me with your spirit. And I'm not asking God to come anoint me and just... No, I already have the Holy Spirit. It's like electricity. If, if the electricity's off, I basically turn it on the electricity. You see? And so I'm asking God to take control. I, 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 don't, I don't want these words to be mine. I want you, because I would be scared to death to get up here and talk to you if it was me and not the Holy Spirit. Because I would want the Holy Spirit to give you this message because I'm not effective. God is effective. This is not even my gift preaching up here. I'm a teacher, but the Holy Spirit gave me that gift. Okay? But, you know, so I ask God to fill me with your spirit. Now, so the Holy the, the when it says be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's imperative. It's in the imperative, which means it's a command, okay? And it's also present tense, okay? So it's not like something happened in the past or when, when you got saved. Filling means it's a present participle. Keep, keep, on, keep on being filled. Keep on being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Instead of using the word filled, it would be better for you to understand just use the word controlled. Keep on allowing God to control your life. Okay? Now, when you sin, what happens? When you sin, you're no longer filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, you still have the Holy Spirit, but you're no longer controlled by the Holy Spirit. So you pray, confess your sins, and then you ask for God to fill you again or control you. Okay? That's called living the Christian life. As you go through life, you sin, you confess your sin right then and there. Don't wait till the night. Because then you'll forget all the sins that you made during the day. Isn't it amazing? Everybody's so spiritual while they sleep. That's the, I mean, they're more spiritual when they sleep than in the day. Because, and they're filled with the Spirit when they, when, at night only because they confess all their sins at night. And they didn't during the day. See? So, confess your sin right away. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, if I have a bad thought in here, or if uh, something's just getting under my skin and I'm, you know, I'm not liking 
you know, the sound or something like that, and I get all bent out of shape about it, I have to pray right there, God, forgive me. I just, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I certainly don't want to get up here in, in the pulpit and, and, and pray without your feeling. Okay? That's called walking in the Spirit. Okay? The Bible says, walk by the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Okay? So, um, are you under the influence of the Holy Spirit? See, And the Holy Spirit, when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, He controls you. He will empower you to do great things. The filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one-time thing. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the one-time thing that happens the moment you are saved. Right. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit happens is the one-time thing. It happens at the moment you are saved. Right. The filling of the Holy Spirit, that's you have to walk by the Spirit uh, continually, day after day. And so, um, you don't have to experience, you don't have to experience earth-shaking feelings and emotions. You don't have to jump, shout, cry, roll on the floor, or have such outward displays of physical emotions to be indwelt with the Spirit, baptized by the Spirit, or even filled with the Holy Spirit. You probably will get pretty excited, though. And you might just want to wave your arms and shout and praise God. You just might want to do that. Instead, in the Baptist churches, we, we've just calmed down quite a bit, you know, because we don't want to, you know, I mean, I'll be too in the spirit, right? And so, so we're like, I, we, I, I miss the guy, this guy, um, uh, Al Bonebreak. Remember him? He had a deep voice. He sang bass in the choir and he'd say, amen, amen. I miss that. You know, I don't hear too many amens out there anymore. I mean, we're just not, not used to that, I guess. But, but um, it, it fires up a preacher when you do that. You know, and I love it when some Pentecostal uh, women come to the church once in a while and they preach it, brother. That's right. You know, and I said, man, so, you know, God just winds me up and then, you know, shout. And, and you know, and those are evidences of the Holy Spirit. But we kind of calm things down because, you know, not supposed to do that. And so, um, God wants to do great things through us. God can change us, transform us. The key is the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. What wings are to birds, what feet are to deer, what breath is to the body, what an engine is to a car, what electricity is to a generator, so is the Spirit of God in the believer. Look at how the Holy Spirit has changed the disciples. A few days before the outpouring of God's Spirit, they were quarreling amongst themselves, self-seeking. Even the Lord's Last Supper, the disciples were quarreling with each other. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to sit on your right side? Who's going to sit on your left side? Who's going to be nearest or next to him? But after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, these were new men. No longer do you read of them quarreling, being selfish or self-seeking. They were no longer doubters like Thomas. And they were not afraid like Simon Peter was when he cowered before a little girl and he swore and even cursed and said, I, I never saw this man. But they were bold and fearless, counting it all joy to even lay down their lives for Jesus. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to give you that power this morning. It's about time we Baptists experienced the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. I'm not trying to make you a Pentecostal church because we're Baptists through and through doctrinally, but we need to pick it up a notch. <laughs> we need to let the Holy Spirit of God empower us so that we might experience God in our lives each day.
Let's pray. Our grace, Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves right now. We have, we're sorry for not placing enough emphasis of the Holy Spirit in, in our own lives. I pray, God, that each and every one of us would understand that you did enter into our lives. You, you came in and, it, and you indwell, your spirit indwells in us and will never leave us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for placing us into the body of Christ, the church, the moment we're saved. And I pray for a filling right now in this church that you would empower each and every one of us as we con allow you to control our lives. And Lord, if there's anyone here in this place who does not know you as their personal Savior, I pray right now that you would tug on their heart, just like that little boy, just like Wilson. And you would convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That they would come to know you as their personal Savior and be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to try to convince you. I'm not going to try to persuade you. I'm not going to try to influence you by my words. I'm just going to shut up right now and I'm going to just let the Spirit of God work in your life. Whatever decision God is calling you, tugging on your heart, no matter what it is, I'm going to allow him to work in your life. And once you know what decision he wants you to make, you come up here and I'll pray with you. Right now, as Kelly plays, allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life and in your heart. stand and sing our closing chorus. bless you too. Bush, lead us in prayer. Our Father in heaven, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the message from your word about the Holy Spirit. Thank you for when you left this earth and you gave us the Holy Spirit so your presence would be everywhere on earth. Control us with the Holy Spirit so that we might be great ministers for you, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world. And now we pray that you are, you are pleased with everything that was said and done here today. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.